That's the question. Jesus Christ, who are you? Who is Jesus? Is he just a revolutionary hero? Or is he something more? Before time began, he existed. He said, before Abraham was, I am. Well, good morning, church. How are you today? Good. I want to uh, jump in, and before I do, at the risk of being redundant to the host at your campus. In fact, if we could, let's welcome all of the campuses today at Midtown. Uh, we're so glad you're here. Downtown, South Tulsa, Jinx, Owasso, Egypt, and Jordan. We're so glad that you've joined us for the day. In fact, but before I go any further, let me just say at Midtown today, uh, Jeff and Rachel Henry are, are starting today. He is the new campus pastor at the Midtown campus. We're so glad uh, that you're here. Welcome uh, the Henrys, if you would, church. Uh, Matt Ward, who was the campus pastor there, has stepped up and is now going to be over all multi-site. And so he'll, the, all the campus pastors will report to Matt Ward, and he'll still worship there at Midtown. But Jeff has come on board. In fact, let me just tell you what I saw on social media this week. When the mayor of his town that he's coming from, Hendersonville, Tennessee, which is not like some little podunk town. This is Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, the mayor of Hendersonville heard that Jeff was uh, coming to Tulsa and leaving. They named a day this last week Jeff Henry Day at, by proclamation uh, of the mayor in that city because of the impact he made on that city. That's the kind of uh, campus pastor God is bringing us to the Midtown campus, and we, we just rejoice over you. But at all the campuses, before I get started today in teaching, I want to talk to you for just a minute about Easter. Easter week is the Super Bowl in the life of a New Testament church. And, and, and it's not about eggs and candy, and I'm into candy, and I love jelly beans, but only jelly bellies. I don't like any of that other cheap stuff. How many of you love jelly beans? Starburst ones are okay, but the jelly bellies are really, really good. The uh, Peeps is the worst excuse for candy I have ever seen in my life. A and the Cadbury egg, how many of you like the Cadbury egg? I just want to gag vomit when I put that, when, when I crack that thing open, it looks like an egg yolk on the inside. I cannot even kind of do it, but, but I'm all about can I love the Reese's egg thing. This is just awesome. It tastes better than it does when it's shaped like a Christmas tree or a regular circle, but, but it, it's good. But it's not, Easter's not about all that. We'll have all kinds of candy here on Extravaganza, but, but it's not about all that. It, it is about Jesus. And it's about what he has done for us, and we cannot miss or blow off that opportunity. And, and so let me just back you up to two weeks from today. This morning when I wrote it out, th this announcement I wrote out three weeks from today. It's not three, it's two. It's just two weeks from today it is extravaganza, uh, Palm Sunday. It's an outreach day. It's a harvest Sunday, not just for kids and all their games, but you bring adults and, and teenagers who don't know the Lord. And on that day, we're, we're going to give a crystal clear gospel presentation, and then we move into Easter week, having seen a hundred people give their life to Christ, which is phenomenal. It just got the whole thing going. And then we move into uh, Good Friday and we're going to do what we started last year, a Good Friday service at all of our campuses. The reviews were so unbelievable uh, and, and the feedback was so unbelievable. What God did to explode our whole church in worship on Saturday and Sunday because of the Good Friday service and getting the thing going, we leave him on the cross on Friday and it's kind of this dark thing and it just, just something happens in our hearts when we come back on Saturday or we come back on Sunday and, and, and we proclaim the resurrection. So here's what I want to say to you. Listen, have your brunch, have your family, get, get a dress or a hat or whatever you want to do. Do all of that. But for the sake of the kingdom, your church needs you to give this week to the kingdom of God, for you to bring people who are far from God, who need a relationship with Jesus, children, boys and girls, men and women. We need you to attend one service and serve two or three services over the weekend. Don't just do your normal thing. We need to take care of all these people's children, et cetera. Welcome them in the parking lot like they matter to God. And so you, you help us. And if in order to bring all the people you're bringing with you on the Easter weekend, you need to attend all all three or four services because you got a different family with you every service, then do that because that's what this is all about. But what your church needs you to do is just go ahead right now and dedicate Palm Sunday all the way to Easter Sunday to Jesus and for the sake of the kingdom. And the preference, in case you're wondering, is that you would come on Friday and Saturday and then serve and bring people on Sunday, okay? So your ticket into Sunday services is a guest on your side. 
All right, if you're not bringing a guest, you come on Saturday. Don't come on Sunday without a guest, okay? This is for guests, it's for new people, it's for fresh people, it's, it's, it's for people we, we've not yet reached, okay? And so I want us to pray together across all of our campuses and let's just ask God for that kind of fire and that kind of uh, contagious spirit on us this week. Grab those cards that were in the seats, just kind of hold them and let's just pray over them and let's just pray that God would give us the right people to give these to, that God would show us who it is He's, He wants us to bring and compel and, and, and invite in to the uh, family of God. So let's just pray together across all of our campuses. Lord Jesus, today uh, over this faith family, I pray anointing. Father, I pray that you would put words in our lips and, and, and like Jeremiah cried, that it would be like a fire in our bones, that we could not keep silent about what you have done for us. Make us grateful, make us contagious, use us in the lives of the people we come in contact with over the next several weeks, and may the kingdom advance. May we push back darkness as a church in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And Father, we thank you for the resurrection and the power that lives within us, and we pray it all over all of our people and over all of our service is today. In Jesus' name we pray, and together we say, amen. Now, if you've not been with us the last several weeks, we've been in the book of John, and we've been working our way through systematically, not verse by verse, but I am by I am. Because Jesus seven times used these specific phrases where, where he said, I am, and that phrase, I am, is an echo of the Old Testament. Back in the story of Moses, where God revealed his name, I am. This is Jesus was echoing that. And every time he does it, it's so rich and it's so deep. And Jesus says, I am the bread of life. And he said, I am the true vine. And I am the light of the world. Seven times he uses these phrases. And every time it, it impacts our life. Not just because he's telling us something about how good he is. I am the bread of life, and God is like bread, and bread is comforting, and, and, and we love, you know, that. Or I am the true vine, and he wants us in community. Those things are all true, but there's something deeper and, and richer behind each of the I am's. And, and I want you to take a look at this. If you got your Bible, turn to John 10. We're going to be there this week and next week because two of the I am's are found in all in one chapter and in John chapter 10, two I am's in one chapter of scripture. And we said, if you weren't here way back in week one, if you want to know Jesus, you don't turn to Facebook and you don't turn to Instagram and you're not going to Twitter and you're not going uh, to fake news, which incidentally is the series we're going to begin right after Easter, fake news. And you don't want to miss uh, that series, but, but you go to the source you go to the scriptures, and not just the scriptures, you actually go to the red letters, the words of Jesus Christ. And that's what we're doing in this series. And, and John 10, Jesus explains to us exactly why he's telling us all these things about himself. And, and, in fact, look at this verse in chapter 10 and verse 10. My purpose, according to Jesus, is to give them a rich and a good life. Who, who is them in, in that text? To give them. A, a rich and a good life. It's all those who believe in and on him. All those who have put their faith in him. Those to whom he has revealed himself. And they have received and recognized him. The them is you and, and me. And so seven times Jesus says, I am. And here he's telling us the purpose of all of these I am's is so that we can have a rich and a good life. Now think about that for just a second rich. There are some that tell you what that means is that you're supposed to have this massive bank account. That cannot be what it means, right? But because there is no minimum balance required in your bank account to follow Jesus Christ. It, it, it's rich in that, it, it, that our lives would be full of all the things that really matter in life. He says a rich life, but he also says a good life, which has bothered me for years because in English, the word good doesn't really mean good anymore right? Like it, it just doesn't mean that when there are words that we could use like great or awesome or radical or amazing or whatever, we could list hundreds of words that sound better than good in our culture. Even dope sounds better than good or lit or Gucci or bougie and all of these words, they all sound better than, than good, right? But, but when your wife looks at you and says, how do I look? And you say, you look, you look good. You need to go back and re-listen to the Save Our Sex series. Because that ain't going to work well for you, right? Or, or, you know, we would say, hey, how's Mexican sound? It's good. It sounds good. 
Or your kid asks you after a ball game or whatever, how did I do? You, you did good. Not great. Right? I, I didn't do great, but, but when you see the word good in the Old Testament, which by the way, it appears over and over and over. And, and in fact, you go back to Genesis and God created the whole world out of nothing, right? It doesn't mean so-so or acceptable in the Bible. It meant that it had been touched by God, that it had his stamp on it. That's what good meant when God said it is good, right? In the first act of the Bible, he, he spoke the world out of nothing into existence, and then he looked at it each time and said, and it's good. Let there be light, and there was light, and it was good good, God said. It meant it had been stamped by him. It had his image on it. And I just want you to hear the words of God over you today. You are good. You're good. Not so-so or yeah, you're okay, but, but that he has stamped his image on you. And this life he has for you has his stamp on it. And sometimes we go through our lives and we wonder who we are. And and we're wondering, am I good enough or strong enough or am I a good enough parent? Do I have a good enough job? Am I pretty enough? And, And he, the Bible says that this good shepherd we're talking about has invited you to a table that he set in the presence of your enemies. And he wants you to sit at this table with him in this intimate relationship with him. And that gets to the very heart of who we are and who God has made us to be. Then Jesus comes along and says, I am. Seven different times. And when we look at Jesus, by the way, Jesus said this, we see God. And the God of the Old Testament who revealed himself in the name I am to Moses is revealed through Jesus, who he was, what he said, what he did, but, but who he is, the, the I am. And, and, and when we play this out in our lives, we, we actually get to see God. And not only do we see God through Jesus, we see ourselves through Jesus. And in other words, that, that when we look to him, he says, I'll show you not just who God is, I'll show you who you are. And so all of our identity issues are solved by coming to the I am's of Jesus. And and in John 10, he's using two images, the sheep gate and the good shepherd. Today we'll do the sheep gate. Next week we'll do uh, the good shepherd. But but they're tied together, same chapter, same story, kind of same imagery, similar concepts. And I'll show you in a bit how these two work together. But let's go to John chapter 10. Let's get a running start back all the way up to, to verse one. And let's pick it up. Look at what Jesus says. I tell you the truth. Anyone who sneaks over the wall of the sheepfold rather than going through the gate must surely be a thief or a robber. But the one who enters through the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. This is Jesus talking in agricultural terms because he grew up around agriculture and and, uh, most of us didn't. God knows I didn't. I I was a city boy, right? I I didn't grow up around uh, cattle and sheep and all of that. Meredith grew up in Arkansas. Yesterday, she's burning brush all day in her Carhartt cover halls. And and last night, uh, she came in to give me a hug and I was like, your hair smells like smoke. And and, and you need to bathe. She said, I did bathe. I said, you, you need to bathe your hair again. And, and it was usually it smells like this be curly Aveda, you know, and now it smells like an ashtray. And, and, uh, and some of you may be into that. I'm not. I, I'm a city boy. I'm like into real nice, fine things. And, and, and so uh, she, you know, she bathed again. And this morning I hugged her. I said, it smells great. And, and, but, but some of you were raised around agriculture. Jesus certainly was. And, and in those days, sheep farmers w- would be in the pasture with their sheep. And, and then they would take the sheep in within the pasture into a sheep pen, which they made of four walls either stone or stick or whatever. And there was an entrance into the pen where they would herd the sheep into the pen at night so that a gatekeeper, they would hire him to watch them to keep them from robbers and thieves and and predators. So the the shepherd would then come back in the morning and, and would collect his or her sheep out of the pen where they'd been protected from or that night. So there's really only two main characters in the story. You got the shepherd and the thief. And for every shepherd who knew the sheep and loved the sheep and raised the sheep and cared for the sheep, there was a thief who wanted to steal and kill. And just as that's true for first century sheep, it's true over your life today. 
You have a good shepherd who is a good, good God who wants to give you a rich and a good life. And there is a bad devil who wants to steal from you. Now, let's keep reading in John chapter 10. Go to the next verse in verse 3. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep recognize his voice, and they come to him. He calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. After he's gathered his own flock, he walks ahead of them, and they follow him because they know his voice. They won't follow a stranger. They will run from him because they don't know his voice. The, the, the shepherd stuff is so amazing that they would open the gate and, and the gatekeeper gets out of the way and they would call the sheep and, and they would call them by name and they recognize the shepherd's voice. I've told you this story before that one time I was in Israel and we were walking, I think it was in Jericho, and, and, and we were walking along the street and here came two or three different shepherds all entering this intersection at the same time with their flocks. And they're out in front of the sheep and the sheep are following. And as they, as they mixed into this mix master, kind of like just, you know, a highway, they, they, they all came together and the sheep all got crowded. And our guide said, watch, 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 watch. And it was telling us to watch. Because it looked as if all of these sheep are going to get confused in this moment. And one may come here and turn and go with that shepherd. And, but it did not happen. Not one single sheep got confused as they all got mixed up in the middle of that intersection. The shepherd just kept walking and speaking. And as the shepherd spoke, the sheep knew exactly which shepherd to follow after. And in fact, with those flocks, most of those shepherds have a name for each sheep, and they know which sheep is which. I don't know what you name sheep. I mean, come on, Flopsy and Wooly and, and whatever, right? And, 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 and Fluffy, and, and, and so they're all coming. But, but I want you to think of this in these terms, okay, because you weren't raised around sheep. Think about our children's areas. A lot of you have children in our kids' areas, and, and, and when you go in, you got badge, right? And, and when you get the badge, you get a sticker, the kid gets a sticker, and, and, and then you walk the kid to class, you, you, you sign them in and leave them there. And I know it's inconvenient, but your inconvenience is our comfort because it means it's working and your children are safe. And then you go after service to go get them out of class and you stand at the door, right? And you say, hey, Addison, how you doing? And she looks up and, and, and your temptation at that point is to open the door. Don't open the door. You don't touch the door. There's only one who can touch the door, and it's the volunteer, right? It's the gatekeeper. You don't open the door. You're not allowed to open the door, but the gatekeeper opens the door, and they'll only open it for the right parent and for the right shepherd, right? This is the picture, and so you get Addison, and you're walking out. You think you're all done, and then there's security again. You're like, oh. Roll your eyes. They know me, right? They know, but, but, they, but they want to check the badge and make sure it's right again. And, and, and they open the gate for the parent, the shepherd. That's the picture of what's playing out here. And, and so what Jesus did in the first five, five verses we just read is he gives us the illustration. Say illustration. Now what he's going to do is give us the explanation. Okay? And much of the Bible is like this, by the way, that, that there's story that is giving, but it's more than a story. The story is always more than a story. And for the physical aspect of Scripture, there's always a spiritual parallel. And that explanation and the spiritual aspect here is all about our identity in Christ. What does it mean to be saved? And what does it mean to walk with Christ or walk with Jesus? And the harsh reality is this, we only get one life to live. And the question is, how are we going to live it? Are we going to make the most of it? And, and there is a very real enemy who wants to steal from you. He is a thief. And according to the Bible, he is the thief. And Jesus came so that you can enjoy the good life. Okay, so, so let's keep reading. Let's jump down a couple verses to verse 9 because I want to get down to 10. Jesus says, yes, I am the gate. Those who come in through me will be saved. They will come and go freely and will find good pasture. In other words, all throughout this passage, Jesus ref is referring to us as sheep. Now, that sounds a little bit insulting, especially if you know anything about sheep. And for years and years, I've heard preachers preach on this passage, and I've heard preachers preach on Psalm 23. And what most sheep, I mean, what mo what's most sheep, what most preachers do at that point is they go study sheep. And then they preach the whole sermon about how stupid and dumb sheep are. How many of you have heard that sermon before, right? And, and, and so, and it's true. They are stupid and they are dumb. They don't have teeth. They don't have fallons. They can't fight. Talons, they can't fight. They, I don't know what a fallon is, but they don't have those either, right? They can't do anything except for get their head stuck in the water, the running water, which will fill their wool up with uh, weight and they'll fall in and the shepherd has to have a crook and get them out. And the whole sermon is built around how stupid we are. 
And I think most of those applications are really good, actually, for most of you. <laughs> but that's not what the text is talking about. The text is not, it makes no indication as to how stupid the sheep are. The, the whole focus of the text is the shepherd and how good he is. So let's just let the scripture speak to itself and speak for itself. Put your finger right here in John 10 and flip all the way back. Maybe most famous scripture in the whole Bible. Psalm 23. And in Psalm 23, that's the place, it's kind of a parallel passage to John chapter 10. That's the place where we learn in a personal way and an intimate way that we are sheep. And God is our shepherd. You don't have to go past the very first verse to find unbelievable application. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. The Lord is my shepherd. Shepherd. There's enough theology in that phrase for us to camp out there for week after week after week. The Lord is my shepherd. My spouse is not my shepherd. My children are not my shepherd. My job is not my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. That, that's why you don't look to Instagram to be your shepherd. Hear me. It will not lead you to a cup running over. It won't. Any testimony to that right here? It will never lead you to a cup running over. Where will it lead you? It will lead you to a place of envy over somebody else's fake news. When what God wants to give you is a reality, not so that you can post it or broadcast it, but so that you can enjoy him. God does not bless you so that you can broadcast it. And hear me as a pastor and a shepherd say to you, sometimes... Sometimes in broadcasting it, you can insta-corrupt it. The joy of what God has put in your heart. And I'm not against social media. I'm not. This is not some old man with a flip phone saying to you, be careful. I'm cooler than most. <laughs> what, what I'm saying to you is be careful. The Lord is my shepherd. By the way, look at this in the scripture, in your Bible. It's all caps. It's all caps. Do you know why it's all caps? Not just because Lord is a big deal. It's because the Hebrew word is Yahweh. It means I am. That is God's name. What he is saying is I am is my shepherd. The I am of the Old Testament, the great I am is our shepherd. And Jesus says, I, I am the gate into the fold and I am your shepherd all here in John 10. And, and when he says I am, uh, uh, he's saying I am God. And God is like, and it is so, so interesting that our English translation in that verse of scripture uses the word Lord. Because it's really a specific name, and it's a specific phrase, and, and you got different ideas about that word in, in English, but certainly even in other languages. In, in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, you see this over and over again. In the Bible, you see Lord of Lords. You see the Lord of all, a Lord, you understand, biblically had complete control. And the question is, do we recognize Jesus as Lord? So easy to say he, he is my shepherd because a shepherd cares for us and a shepherd protects us and a shepherd feeds us, but, but, but a shepherd is more than that in Scripture. The shepherd is the owner the sheep belong to the shepherd. And God is not some being that is subject to all of our whims and, and, and wants. We are subject to him. He, he's the one who is God. And that's so hard for you and me in an American mindset. It's easier for those in Jordan and in Egypt to take this in but because they understand it a little better with an Eastern mindset. But with a Western mindset, our whole mindset is, is don't tell me what to do. You ain't the boss of me, right? I'm my own person, and I'll do whatever I want to do. And, and, but we have to understand that doing whatever we want is not doing whatever we think will make us feel good. Doing what is good for us is what we're supposed to do. Doing what leads us to the good life and doing what's right, and that comes from understanding ownership. And understand that God owns us and he made us and he created us and he made us for a relationship with him. Could it be that in our pursuit of things or in our pursuit of happiness that somehow we've lost sight 
of what's really good in life. This week we did uh, two funerals. One uh, for Olita Elich. Her, her husband, Woody, went to be the Lord uh, uh, not that long ago. But, uh, and, and then also Jim Leonard, who was a hero uh, of faith in our church. He was on the team that brought me here a, as the pastor. A, and heroes uh, of the faith. In fact, Jim Leonard, just two hours before he died last Saturday, sent me a happy birthday message. And two hours later, sitting there with his wife, he just went to heaven, which is exactly how I want to go. But in all the years as a pastor where I've sat at the deathbed with people, never one time do you find out how trivial people are. Every time you find out what's important to them and what's a big deal in their lives. And I've never heard somebody say, I wish I had accumulated more stuff. They've, I've never heard somebody say in my lifetime, I wish I would have chased after this or had that vehicle or had that house or had that thing. I, I, I wish I'd had more. There is an enemy who wants you to see life that way. But Jesus wants to set us free from that trap. Now turn back to John chapter 10 out of Psalm 23. Let's go back to where we were because we got to get down to this key verse in verse 10 because it's important that Jesus wants to give us life, abundant life, good life. But there is an enemy that wants something different for us. Now look at this verse in verse 10. The thief's purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. But my purpose, Jesus says, is to give them a rich and a good life. Now that's the NLT. A lot of you ask me, what do you preach out of usually? NLT usually, New Living Translation. I love it because it sounds like our vernacular. It sounds like our English today. But there's one word that, that is present in the Greek that is not present in the NLT. And it's an important word to this text. In fact, look at the NIV. They get it right. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. That word is very, very important because it is in the text. And what it means is, is the devil comes for one reason. No other reason. He is not your friend. He is not your buddy. He is not going to help you. In fact, he's not capable of helping you. And even if he were capable of helping you, he, he wouldn't. He has one goal, only, say only. And that's your utter destruction. And these three things, steal, steal kill, and, and, and destroy, they're not multiple choice things. And every commentator I've ever read on this text, the original Greek grammar, points to the fact that the word only modifies the verb to steal, meaning he is a thief. And so that is his M.O. That is what he's going to do in your life. When he comes, you know he comes lying. When he comes, you know he comes to steal. It is not a good thing. It's his plan. It's what he plans to do to attack you. He steals, he kills, and he destroys. That's what he does. What is he stealing? Your identity. He can't have your life if you're a child of God, right? You're a possession of the King of Kings. But, but what he will do is steal your identity as a child of the King of Kings. And, and it, when he comes into your life, if he can't have it, he wants to destroy who you are at the core. That's accomplished by lying to you. And he will put those goggles on that we talked about last week. If you weren't here last week, go on uh, the website and watch last week. Because he will put goggles on you to force you to see things that aren't true. Then he will tell you things about yourself that are not true. He will tell you things about your heavenly father that are not true. And once he does that and he gets you to believe it, he has your life. But he won't stop there. He wants to destroy everything about you. The attack of the enemy is an attack on your identity. And the way that Jesus brings life is to reassure you of your identity, who you are in Christ. He calls himself the gate. But what does that mean? There was a gate to the sheepfold. We saw that into the pasture. But out in the pasture is a pen where, where they would be stored at night. And so Jesus is the gate. Let me tell you what that means. It means, first of all, write this down. He is the gate to salvation. That's maybe the most obvious and clear application of this text. He is the gate to salvation. In fact, he is the only gate to salvation. Meaning what? There is no way in but by him. That sounds so incredibly exclusive, doesn't it? In our culture, that's so problematic for something to be exclusive. But it is exclusive. It's fair because everybody's invited. 
is fair because everybody comes the same way. There is no other way. Everybody is invited and everybody comes the same way. But it is true. It is exclusive. But I want to remind you, church, in a relative society, all truth is exclusive. All truth is exclusive. Two plus two is four exclusively. It is not 3.9 or 4.1. And when Jesus said he is the gate, it's just akin to the place where he says later, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man gets to the Father except through me. And the fact that that he's the I am, uh, which by the way, that's the truth we're going to look at in a couple of weeks on Palm Sunday, on the Harvest Sunday, when you bring friends that don't know the Lord, that's the I am we're going to look at. That Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And if that is true that Jesus is the way, and that is true that Jesus is the gate, we must bring people to him. Because he's the only way. And we need to make sure that they're here to hear that message. And and we need to uh, get people to come to hear and experience Jesus, the gate, and Jesus, the good shepherd. Why? So that they can be saved. So that their lives can be changed. So that they can become a part of the flock. And when they experience Jesus just like us, they reap the benefits of knowing Jesus. What are the benefits? This is a whole other sermon. I wish I had time to do it, but just look at this text. Just go back and look at it again in verse 3. There there are four benefits that I find that we find as being in the fold and in the pen and in, uh, uh, in the body of Christ and being sheep that belong to him. The, the first benefit is, is they will hear his voice. What a privilege to hear, to hear the voice of Jesus. He says the sheep come to him, right? And, and, and by the way, the only way they can hear his voice is to enter into a relationship with him. The, the, the second benefit is they can respond to him. Do you know not all of us can respond to him? The Bible says you can't respond unless he's drawing What a privilege it is to hear his voice. What a privilege it is to respond to his voice, right? The Bible says his sheep come to him. They they hear the voice and they respond to it, which activates this whole amazing grace thing in in, in our lives. And and to those of you who are his children, let, let me just say to you, listen to his voice and respond to it. Question, who is he leading you to invite? in the next few weeks? Who is he leading you to bring? Who is he leading you to compel to be here with you this Easter season? Listen to his voice and respond to it. The third benefit is they know him intimately. Your friends and your family and your children's friends and their family, they they can hear his voice, they can respond to it, and they can know him in an intimate way. The, The Bible says his sheep know him and he knows each of them by name. Do they have an intimate and a personal relationship with the shepherd? The same one that he has with us. And he wants that with all. Another benefit the scripture points out is that they can make him the Lord of their lives. Which is where the rich and the good life begins. That's where that's kicked into overdrive. The the, the shepherd says, uh, the scripture says that the shepherd leads them out. You'll never see a shepherd behind the sheep cracking a whip. That's what a hired hand does. The shepherd just walks out in front and the sheep follow. He's leading them. He's not driving them like they're cattle. And in order to be led, they have to make him their Lord, right? And and they have to have a relationship with him. They'll never know the good life apart from a relationship with him. And if you're here today, by the way, I don't want to skip over you to the group that will be here on Easter and not give you a chance to do that. And if you're here today and you've never trusted Christ, I still have a few more things I want to preach so nobody move. But I do want to call a time out here in the middle of this, not middle, towards the end of this message. And give you a chance to come to know Christ if you have not done that already. At all of our campuses watching online, we're so glad you're here. But if you don't hear his voice and you haven't responded to his voice and you don't know him intimately and you don't know him as Lord, you can settle that today. And I want to help you do that. Would you pray with me? Every head bowed and every eye closed. 
every heart open. And right where you are, would would you just pray after me? I'm going to pray it one phrase at a time so that you can simply repeat it. The Bible says, if you confess with your mouth Jesus as your Lord and believe in the heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. I want to help you do those two things today, right where you are. You're going to hear people praying all around you at every campus. If you want to trust Christ, would you just pray with me and say, dear God, I I know I'm a sinner. I've messed it up. But today I ask you to forgive me for all my sin. Jesus, come into my life to be my Lord, my Savior, and my forgiver. In the best way that I know how, I turn my back on my sin and I trust you alone, Jesus, to save me. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name we pray. And together we all say amen. Would you welcome men and women and boys and girls into the family of God? He's the gate to salvation, but he's also the gate to protection. Look look at verse 9 again. This is the pen out in the pasture that he's talking about, right? And, And he says that those who come in through him, they will come and go freely in and out of the pen. In other words, they have freedom. They have new life. They are free. And and you ought to ask yourself this question. This is kind of a litmus test. Am I free? If I know I'm forgiven, am I free? And, And if the answer to that is no, hear me, you need a community group. You need a community group. You cannot just come sit in rows and find true freedom. You have to sit in a circle at some point during the week with men and women who love the Lord and love you. Why? Because if you want forgiveness, you confess it to God. If you want freedom, you confess it to people. That's James, by the way. And James makes that so incredibly clear. And just by saying it, that I'm dealing with this, I'm feeling this, I'm thinking this, just by saying it out loud, it loses its power on you. It loses its grip on you. It becomes something silly because there are other people that listen to you and go, I used to think that, or I believe it, or let me just pray for you right now. You got to get in community. If you want real freedom, look, he's the gate to protection, but he's also the gate to provision. They will come and go freely and they will find good pasture. What do you think of when you think of good pasture? And can I just say to you, the Middle Eastern concept in Psalm 23, he will lead me to green pastures. He he will lead me to provision what you have in your head and, and what we naturally would get in our head in Oklahoma or in Kansas this time of year is the rye or the barley turning green and it just covering acres and acres and acres and, and, and there's a fence around it. Th- th- this is what you have in your mind. That he will lead me to green pastures. Listen, that does not exist anywhere in the Middle East. And it certainly didn't back then. It's a desert. There are more rocks than there are blades of grass. And and what what would happen is the breeze would blow the moisture off of the sea or off of a river and and it would condensate and then it would collect on a rock. And when it would cool off because of the rock, it would create one little driplet or droplet of water that would fall into that rock below it. And and it would be just enough moisture into the earth for it produce one green uh, blade of grass or one green plant. And, And this is more what green pasture looks like in Psalm 23. And it's not that we just let the sheep into the pasture and and close the gate and let them go acres and acres and, and, and just be free. No, no, no. Only the shepherd knows where this is on a daily basis. And by the way, after they eat it today, it won't be there tomorrow. The shepherd has to take them somewhere else and has to lead them somewhere else where tomorrow's provision is available because yesterday's provision is not enough for tomorrow. And only the shepherd knows that. The greatest demise, in my opinion, other than a lack of forgiveness in the body of Christ today is this thought that I should be further along than that. I can't believe I did that. I can't believe I thought that. I can't believe I said that. I should be further along than that. That is a lie straight out of the pit of hell. 
That is not the plan for the children of God, for them to be at the place where they can look and go, I should have been past that. I should have been beyond that. I should have never done that. Any Christian can make any mistake on any given day at any time. That, that is fact. That is the way it walks out. That is the way it experiences. I experience it every day as a pastor. I meet mature believers who all of a sudden did this, who all of a sudden did that, who all of a sudden were uh, succumbed to this temptation. Listen to me. That's not the plan for you. For God to lead you into a pasture, open a gate, let you go, and let you wander around and do whatever you want with a gate shut under the protection of that. That's the plan for you. That you have a shepherd who will lead you day by day, step by step, moment by moment. You will never mature beyond that place, this side of heaven. That's not God's plan for you. Your plan is to stay so close to the shepherd, so close to the shepherd's voice, that he will lead you to this blade of grass today and that blade of grass tomorrow and you neglect that intimacy and you neglect that relationship you you get out of the habit as some are in the habit of doing in the book of Acts to neglect the meeting together with the faith family you walk away from biblical community listen to me it will be you that you read about in the paper this is God's plan for you that's how good he is to you That's how much he wants you nestled up to his side. That's how much he loves you and wants your presence and he wants his presence in your presence. The Bible says five times in this passage, I'm gonna tease you about next Sunday. Five times in this passage, because I gotta figure out how to tie a bow and all this. I lay my life down. I lay my life down. I lay my life down. No one takes it from me. I lay my life down. And Jesus is talking about being the gate. Why is that metaphor, I lay my life down, so important in this illustration that Jesus would say it five times? And when you see these sheep pen, by the way, there's an opening, but, but there's no gate. There's an opening, but there's no gate into the pen. And what Jesus is getting at is what the shepherd would do at night or the gatekeeper would do at night. He would lay himself in the opening saying to any predator or thief who wants to come, you want to get to my sheep, it's over my dead body. You want to get to one of mine, you got to come through me. There's an opening but no gate. And Jesus is saying, hey, I am the gate. I am the opening. I'm the one who will lay here on your behalf and for your protection. That's who I am. And and by the way, in this text, Jesus contrasts himself with a hired hand. The good shepherd versus the hired hand. The the gate versus the one who sneaks over the fence. He, He is making a contrast here and the hired hand doesn't really care about the sheep. They view this as a job. And when a predator, history says this, Jesus alludes to it in the text. We'll get there next week. But when a predator comes and and comes after one of the sheep, the hired hand doesn't care for the sheep, doesn't love the sheep, will take one of the sheep and throw it sacrificially to the predator to occupy the predator eating that one lamb so that he or she could get away as a hired hand. And Jesus is contrasting this good shepherd with the hired hand. It's the exact opposite of what Jesus did for the flock. It's exactly the opposite. Jesus took himself and threw himself to the predator so that the predator could not get to the sheep. He jumped up on a cross and died for you and me. He sacrificed himself for the whole flock. That's the difference between a hired hand and the gate. And that's the difference between a hired hand and a good shepherd. And church, listen to me, that's the confidence we have in Jesus. As we move into this Easter season, that's the confidence. He is the one that we are inviting people to. He's the one. The one who gave himself up, the one who sacrificed himself, the one who laid himself on the altar and said, I am the gate. He laid himself in the opening. He's the one we're inviting our friends to. He's the one we're inviting our neighbors to. He's the one we're inviting our children's friends to. He's the one. And that's what this season is all about. And we're inviting him to very, 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 very good news. We're inviting them to the I am. Let's pray together. Father, today I pray anointing over my faith family. 
I, I pray that you would put words in their mouth. I pray you would put fire in their bones. I pray that you would even now begin to give them names and faces and, and, and relationships and people that you love and that you want a relationship with and that you're the I am, not just for us, but for them as well. Give us eyes to see those around us. Give us ears to hear what's happening in the spiritual world and in the heavenlies. Give us courage, Lord. Give us boldness, Lord, to reach out to them, to introduce them to the shepherd, to invite them to the gate. God, give us creative and imaginative ways to engage with the culture all around us this Easter season. Father, I pray for each man and each woman and each boy and each girl under the sound of my voice today that calls this faith family their church, success as a minister of the gospel. I pray you would give them favor. I pray that you would give them relational equity. I pray that you would give them emotional EQ and understanding to, to broach every subject a, a, as an ambassador of Christ. And as we go from this place, we walk in and under the anointing of the Holy Spirit of God. In Jesus' name we pray, and together we all say amen. Amen. Would you give the Lord a hand today? And, and I just want to say to you, at every campus, at every campus just out the door is a pastor's guest reception. One of us will be there. We'd love to meet you. love to say hello to you. love to put a face with a name. You are dismissed. I love you. We'll see you next weekend. Hey, thanks for watching. Remember to click subscribe and turn on your notifications if you haven't already so that you don't miss a single thing. You can also connect with us on Facebook and Instagram and at our website, thechurch.at. Again, thank you so much for watching and we'll see you next time.